As we go to prayer this morning, there are so many that are in need. We do have a praise we want to give, and that is that uh, Linda is doing better. She actually ended up having the staples removed after her surgery, and she is possibly going to be coming home on Wednesday. Of course, they're looking at the weather to make sure that it's going to be okay after she's, uh, you know, slid already once and ended up having to have hip surgery. There might be some uncertainty if we end up having the ice come in. But, you know, at least she is uh, at that point where she feels good enough to be able to say that she's given the physical therapist a hard time and saying, when can I go home? And that's good news, right? So we need to continue to praise God for that. And then also, Ray has returned from going to the doctor and, and is looking for hip surgery in the future as well and right now they're kind of working through all of that and trying to make sure that he can pass the pre-op and what have you but I believe by faith that God can see that through so that he can have surgery don't you and then I know there's so many others that we've got Lindsay coming up here and here in just a little over well I guess about a week and a half now she's going to be looking at having a stent put in or shunt put in not a stent sorry having a shunt put in and uh, so we're praising God for that as well because it could have been more invasive of surgery and so we do want to praise God but yet at the same time you know surgery is still surgery right and so we need God to, to oversee and be there I'm sure that there's probably plenty of others that don't come to my mind right now but uh, are on our hearts and on our minds and we do need to remember to pray for each and every one. So, uh, yes, we need to remember Ann, who's not been feeling well at home. And so we need to remember her as we go through, as the, she goes through this as well. Hey, she's doing better, but, you know, still not good enough to feel like she could come to church today. And Miss Lois isn't here, and I'm not exactly sure what's going on. I know I kept up with her on Wednesday, and she was she was still a little bit unhappy that she hasn't gotten results back from the doctor's visits and what have you and so anyway you know but god is good and all the time god is good and so let's go to prayer at this at this time my gracious heavenly father i do thank you for all that you do for us i pray heavenly father for your anointing and your blessing upon this time together and we believe by faith heavenly father that those who are in need you're already aware of you're already working in each and every one of those situations and that you will continue to do so. And so we just ask, Heavenly Father, that as your healing touches upon them, that they will make sure and give you all the honor and glory and praise. And you know, Heavenly Father, that we're going to give you all the honor and glory and praise. And we just want to thank you right now for those that you have been so close to, those who have gone through surgery and, and are on the other side of it and, and uh, healing is coming. We want to thank you and praise your holy name for that. And we just ask that you would continue to be so close to each and every one of them. But those that are looking to surgery, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just be so close and that you would just help them to, to um, know that uh, they are not alone, that you are going to be there with them, not only with them, that they, but you also are going to be with the, uh, the surgeons and the the nurses and all of those that are going to prepare or that are going to be provide the health care that they need. And so we just ask for a very special anointing to be upon each and every one of them as well. And for those, Heavenly Father, that are going through grieving time, we just ask that you would just uh, be so close, that you would wrap your loving arms around, especially families like the Renaults who have lost their father here. And uh, we just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just be so close to this family as they go through that process, that you would be with uh, 
Joanne and the loss of her sister as well. And just wrap your loving arms around her and the rest of the family as she goes through that process. And with my dad and my brothers as well and myself as, uh, as we go through and the extended family involved there as well. Just be so close to each and every one throughout this uh, process that, that uh, well, we call the grieving time. And just uh, be so close to each and every one and, and uh, just speak to their hearts and minds in a way that only you can as the Lord God Almighty. So, Heavenly Father, though, as we continue to worship you, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds. Help us to receive from you today what it is that you want us to receive. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. And the kids, didn't they do so good? They just came down here and prayed. While you guys are there, let me pray for you. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for these children. We were reminded in your word where the children wanted to come to, to you as the son and to be able to, and, and yet the disciples tried to rebuke them and send them away, but yet your son rebuked the disciples and said, bring the children to me. So, Heavenly Father, that's what we're going to do. We're bringing the children to you. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for their lives and the lives that they represent and how they can come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior at a very young age. And so that is our prayer. That is our heart's desire, that they would come to know you and that that relationship would continue throughout all of eternity. For we do ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Seeing them kneeling at the altar prayer just reminded me. You know, it wasn't intentional. But yet, when we look at the Scripture, it seems like it was intentional for the disciples to tell the children to go away. Aren't we so thankful that Jesus said, Bring the children to me. This morning we're going to take a look at the back half of a very well-known parable. Over the years, this parable has become known as the parable of the lost son or the parable of the prodigal son. However you want to call it uh, is, is not really relevant. But I want us to take a look at the older brother in this particular story. And so we're going to take a look at Luke's gospel account. We're going to be looking at it in, in chapter 15. And we're going to look at verses 25 through the end of the chapter 32. Luke 15, verses 25 through 32. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. As always, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word. And we want to thank you once again for this opportunity that we have to spend some time in your word. As we prayed earlier, we do ask that you would open our hearts and minds to help us to be able to hear from your word what it is you want us to hear today. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 
Well, as I said a while ago, I want to kind of look at this portion. We're, next week, we're actually going to look at the story of the prodigal son or the lost son. But I believe a lot of times we have a tendency to kind of not allow this story to be brought to the forefront. But I believe it's important for us to recognize it in this particular story of exactly what the older brother may be going through. As we've been talking about for, since the first of the year, I believe it's important for us to begin to pray for those who maybe don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And next week when we do the story of the prodigal son, we're actually going to take the opportunity to be able to put the names of people. We're going to write out the names of people on a cross that's going to be standing here before us. You're going to write the names of people on there that you're pretty sure don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And we're going to pray for those people. And I'm, I'm just going to hope and believe by faith that as you see people's names on there, you may not know who they are. You're still going to lift them up in prayer. But you know, not everybody who hears is going to receive what it is that they should receive. And that's what this story is somewhat about. It's about a brother who is lost but doesn't even really recognize or realize that he is lost. Because when we see in this story, one of the things that I believe is right, right there in front of you is this whole idea and this concept the, of the brother being very self-righteous. And as he is being self-righteous, there are certain things that come to light. And so we're going to expand upon those. But before we do that, I want to share a few examples of real life of examples of people that maybe have just a little bit of a self-righteous attitude. Okay? There's a gentleman by the name of Merv Grzynski. He actually lives in Oklahoma City, and he purchased a brand new 32-foot-long Winnebago motorhome. On his first trip, having driven out onto the highway, he set the cruise control at 70 miles an hour and then calmly left the driver's seat to go into the back and make himself a cup of coffee. Well, not surprisingly, the RV left the freeway, crashed, and overturned. Mr. Grzynski sued Winnebago for not at, for not advertising or not advising him. Sorry, in the owner's manual, that he could not do that. The jury actually awarded him one point seven five million dollars plus a brand new replacement motorhome. The company has since then changed their manual based on this suit, just in case that there were any other people who are buying their, rec their recreational vehicles were unsure as to what the cruise control really does. Or what about this guy? Is a customer who was awarded seven, or I shouldn't say guy, sorry, this lady was awarded $780,000 in a lawsuit against a store owner after she tripped over her own out-of-control child. Is that not ridiculous? Or, get this one. There was a car thief who was actually awarded $74,000 in a suit against the motorist when the thief's hand was crushed as he was trying to steal the hubcaps on an occupied moving car. Yeah, there are people out there like that. What about this one? A burglar received $500,000 against a homeowner when the thief became trapped in the garage of the house that he was robbing. And finally, there was a man who was awarded $14,500 in a suit against the dog owner despite the fact that the injured man had provoked the dog, which, by the way, was chained up in the backyard behind a fence. He had provoked the dog to bite him by entering into the yard and shooting the dog repeatedly with an air rifle. 
Oh, people. It's amazing what people are willing to do out of self-righteousness. Or, could I even say greed? But in this particular story, here is the loyal, faithful, obedient son working hard but feeling neglected and unrecognized. The old old brother returns home from his work and he's able to hear the bass thumping and then the party is going on and he is aware of everything. It, it, it just it sounds diff- different than normal. Normal, he probably came home and the house was probably quiet. But there was something going on. There was commotion happening. And it made him upset when he began to find out that there was a party that was being done because his brother had returned. He's not just upset. He's actually angry. And he refuses to go in and join the party. I don't know about you guys, but... Can you really blame him? We have a tendency to. But to be honest, at first glance, I I can kind of understand this brother's frustration here. I mean, most all of you know that my, my parents had five boys. And as it turns out, I'm the oldest of the five boys. How many oldest children do we have here? All right. As oldest children, those of us that are oldest... You, you will feel my pain, will you not? Including my own daughter will feel the pain of what it means to be the oldest. It seems like most of the responsibility falls upon the oldest ones. And it's true in this situation as well. Life has been rough for him. Life has not been fun. Life has not been easy. And I'm not here to debate whether the older or younger siblings have it better or have it worse. But it is clear in this story that the older brother has lived a life that has appeared to be much more obedient. That he has actually honored his father more than the younger brother. But we see in this story that the father just doesn't seem to understand why the older one is so upset. I mean, really, the only one who should be, have any reason to be upset about the news of the prodigal son's return would have been the fatted calf. Thank you for getting that one. By refusing to go in and forcing the father to come to, to him, we now find that the older sin is actually, is actually committing something that is very taboo to the Jewish culture of the day. You see, he is exercising his self-righteousness. And yet again, we find a father who is deeply committed to his children, willing to ignore the social protocol in order to come out and plead with his son. One translation actually says that the father begged his son to come in. But he is mad that the father would lower himself to take back the sinner. You see, the older brother refused to have a forgiving heart. Hey, have you ever talked to someone who refuses to forgive someone else who has wronged them? Or that they were more concerned about being, quote, right than just moving forward in a relationship? The older brother is doing the same thing here and does not realize that this self-righteousness is keeping him from being able to have a relationship with his father and possibly even having a relationship with his younger brother as well. This part of the parable shows a distinct difference between religion versus relationship. It was common in that day and time that if one were to have already asked for their inheritance, That if they leave, they were not invited to come back. If they ever were to come back, the protocol of the day would have been to kill the younger brother. That would have been the norm. That's what religious rites were. Jewish custom religious rites were that you would no longer have a brother or a son that had done that to you. That was normal. That's what religion got you. 
But in this particular story, we see a father who says, hey, it's not about religion. It's about the relationship. Like the older son, some will squander the life of a loving relationship with Jesus and others by trying to be good enough. But endlessly pursuing the righteousness that ends in self-righteousness and ending up being outside of the house while the true life is going on inside the house. The brother had to be willing to accept, but he wasn't because he was self-reliant. You ever tried to tell a three-year-old, or have you ever tried to help a three-year-old that says, I can do it myself? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but we teach our children and our grandchildren how to be self-sufficient. And yet, when we see that they might need some help, we think, and we begin to think that they are over their heads, we have a tendency to want to try to step in, and then we find out they don't always want our help. You see, the father in this parable thinks that his older son is in over his head, that this unforgiveness is something that he needs some help with. But the oldest brother who has been raised to be self-sufficient and has become self-reliant over the years, now understands that the older brother feels the need to boldly call his father's attention to some of the facts that he believes have been obviously overlooked. The first one is he wants to remind him that he has been there all those years. he would never left. He also wants to remind him that he had been slaving for him. That isn't easy work to be a slave, is it? He even reminds him that he has never disobeyed. But then, he also wants to point out that he had never even let him have a little goat to celebrate anything with his friends. You see, the older brother's attitude shows that his years of obedience to his father has been years of grim duty and not of loving service. William Barclay says this about it. His attitude is one of utter lack of sympathy. He offers to the prodigal, not as my brother, but as your son. You have, who has squandered your property with prostitutes has now come home. Now, we must recognize here that earlier in the story, which we will be looking into next week, it is not ever mentioned that he squandered things on prostitutes. It said on wild living. I don't know about you guys, but I kind of wonder, uh, you know, there's this thought in the back of my head that how would he know that his brother had squandered them on prostitutes? Unless it was maybe something that he would have done if he had taken his inheritance early. Oh, that opens up a whole new can of worms right there, doesn't it? But he has this bitter heart. And so he takes delight in sharing these gruesome details to his dad. He wants to make sure that his dad understands, I have been here the whole time, and you have not recognized me. I could have been the one that asked for the inheritance. I could have been the one who squandered it all. I could have been the one who was out having fun and having a great time. But no, I stayed here. I was self-reliant. I fixed things. I took care of things. You never had to, uh, anything you ever asked me to do, I took care of it. And you don't even recognize me. But when it comes right down to it, he should have been self-reliant. You see, I read a story about a missionary surgeon 
who once stopped to see one of the ladies of a village that he had once operated on. The lady and her husband were dirt poor. Their source of income was reliant upon their livestock. They had a rabbit and two chickens. The woman would often comb the rabbit and then would take its hair and spin it into yarn, which she used to sell in order to make some money. And the chickens provided the eggs that they would eat for food. Anyway, this woman insisted that the missionary stay for lunch. And so he accepted the invitation. But he says, I need to go and visit someone else who I have operated on that lives right down the road, and I'll be back shortly. He was gone for about an hour and a half. And when he returned, he peeped into the cooking pot to see what was going to be for lunch. And in the pot, he saw the rabbit and the two chickens. You see, this woman had given up both her income and her only source of food. She'd given up everything, which, of course, led the missionary surgeon to tears. See, at any time, the older brother could have relented and softened his heart towards his younger brother. But the Scripture does not tell us that he changes his mind. He remains self-righteous and self-reliant, leading us into a confrontational leading him into a confrontational discourse with his father. We might expect the father to turn away from such a bitter and hateful attitude, but we still find a loving and patient father who previously restored a vertical relationship between the prodigal son and the father now is trying to reconcile a horizontal relationship between the prodigal and the older son. The father gently pleads, My son, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. He doesn't let, he doesn't let the older son distance himself from the younger one. He says, This brother of yours was dead and alive again. He was lost. And he is found. When asked what part of the law was most important, Jesus could sum it up, the entire law, within two commands. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. In this one parable, the Father is actively seeking to restore both the relationship between God and man and the relationship between man and man. We're never told how the older son return, responds to the parable. And we're never told how the Pharisees and the teachers of the law respond to it either. I suppose the response is not nearly as important as what our response is. Because we see the older brother, who is so wrapped up in his own righteousness and self-reliance, but the father who still sees a heart of that was lost is now found. A life that was dead is now revived. The father in the parable never tells the older brother that what the younger brother had done was no big deal. Jesus didn't say, well, to each its own. He simply looks beyond our actions to the potential that exists in each person. He looks into the heart. John Wesley is one of the great his holiness writers that I know. And when speaking about Christian living, Wesley says this, Christian perfection is nothing higher and nothing lower than this, the pure love of God and man. The loving God with all of our heart and soul and our neighbors as ourselves, it is the love that is governing the heart and life, running through all of our tempers or emotions, words, and our actions. I ask no more, and I'm interested in no other sort of perfection 
or holiness. You see, we are often tempted to try to define holiness through behavior by making lists of appropriate and inappropriate actions. But truly, according to the Bible, which is a very good guide for, our, for holy living, Wesley defines it simply as perfect love. The older son in the story claimed to have obeyed all of the father's commands. But his heart still lacked holy love for his own lost brother. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word. Help us to take the word that we've heard today and recognize that there may be some that will hear the word. but aren't willing to accept the Word. And that can be very challenging to us. And sometimes we can feel like we might maybe are failures when things like that happen. But you do give us free will. And you give us the opportunity, Heavenly Father, to be able to spread the Gospel by the things that we say and do. So help us, Heavenly Father, as we pray so many times to be the light that you've called us to be into this darkened world. And help us also to bring hope to those who may feel so hopeless. And as we do so, Heavenly Father, may we see lives being transformed, lives being changed because of our willingness to say, that person, this person, whatever persons that we come in contact with, need to know Jesus just like we do. For we ask this to be done in the precious name of Jesus. And all of God's people will say, Amen.